Thank you, Father. In the name of our Christ, Jesus Christ, we have prayed. Amen. You know, we began a series that really has been a little bit of a deviation from what we would have thought to be a planned series of teachings for this quarter. But I do believe that this is timely for us as a church, as a family, as a community, to address really what they call the elephant in the room, to talk about the issues that matter to people in our community. The issue of mental health, the issue of depression and suicide, suicide, and why that matters for us to, to convey the importance of this and, and to address the consequences of not conveying the importance of mental health. Last Wednesday, we delved into a question, a series, a question and answer series uh, that we discussed some of the practical questions that people have about mental health. By the grace of God, uh, together with Dr. Emma Chinedozi, we, we answered some of the questions that, you know, people have out there. How does mental health, you know, commingle with the Christian faith? And how can the church be more effective in discussing uh, some of the issues that arise in real people? And we talked about the fact that falling is human. It is human to fall. God doesn't fall. And he just don't fall anymore. Even the devil doesn't fall. That the, the, the phenomenon of falling, falling from grace, falling from power, falling from repute, falling in any way, is a completely human thing. Economies fail. Systems of governance fail. People's character fail. Reputations crash. And this is something that is within the realms of humanity. And we talked about the fact that falls are real, they are noisy, and they can be destructive. We went through scriptures to show you from the book of Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 16 that even the righteous are expected to fall sometimes. The book of Proverbs chapter 24 and verse number 16 in the infinite mercy of God, in the infinite wisdom of God also, he predicted that even a just man, a just woman, a righteous person, for a righteous man falleth seven times, he says. A righteous man, not an unbeliever, not a sinner, uh, not an unrighteous wicked person, a righteous man falleth seven times. Did you hear that? Falleth seven times. And what did he say? He says, and rise up again. A righteous man can fall seven times and rise up again. But the wicked shall fall into mischief. Mischief is lack of transparency, pretense. It is somebody who is a, a devil in sheep clothing. Someone who has not come to acknowledge their own humanity. Their, the failings of their own character. Somebody who wants to judge everyone else in the world. But fails to recognize the fault in their own lives. And unfortunately, one thing that is being manufactured in the Christian church. Is this high-mindedness. That everyone else is a sinner. And the preachers are the righteous ones. The, the church people are the righteous ones. And that's not true. It has never been true. And it will never be true. It wasn't true then. It's not true and it will never be true. No man is righteous. No one is perfect. In fact, the, a preacher is, are, are, are people who typically have, the, have real issues. Because God, one thing we know for, for a fact is God does not choose the perfect. You hear what I'm saying? God doesn't choose perfect people to preach. He chooses people who he can teach by practice, by real life. The dividends of grace... Who he can pass through the experiment of grace and character molding and building such that they can become more empathetic 
and more authentic and more welcoming to others. But unfortunately, something happens when, when God picks up people who are nothing and makes them into something, all of a sudden they feel like that they're, they're angels. They feel like their lives have been transformed and they're now in the, in the class of angels. And they talk fancy and they act fancy and they begin to look at everyone else as, you know, human beings and we're all angels. We're not. It's a com complete nonsense, bogus rubbish. There is nothing further from the truth. Falls are real, they are noisy and can be destructive. And even the righteous can fall. But when they fall, they rise up again. Shout amen. Shout a big amen. We went through the story of Apostle Peter. That Peter himself, although he had proclaimed before God that he would never disappoint the Lord Jesus, he fell. And when he fell, his falling was catastrophic. It was public. It was shameful. He made a lot of noise. Everyone in the community knew that Peter had made a promise to God, had made a promise not to fall, not, had made a promise to stand by Jesus. And they saw and they heard G, G, Peter denounce and deny Jesus in a public manner. And we talked about the King David whose falling was also destructive. It was notable. It put an, an, an asterisk to his name forever. Everyone knew about what he did. Now, not only did he do something wrong, he tried to cover what he did, and in so doing, did even worse. Shout amen. And I, and I went about telling us how we can deal with some of the, of the, of the issues that lead us into a place of isolation that then births depression and then, and then leads to suicide. That personal failings should just be acknowledged as that. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. When we realize that you are part of the all, that you are part of the all, that all have sinned, and falling short of the glory of God and scriptures cannot be broken. And if that is true and you're part of the all, then it gives you a sense of relief that this is part of the human experience and humility. Shout amen. Such that the grace of God then makes sense to us. That the grace of God is given, not earned. And that the grace of God transforms, doesn't leave you the way you are. But for you to be transformed means that where you were before is not your final destination. So no one is where they ought to be because God is still in the process of molding us and building us up. And so yeah, darkness will come. Personal failures will come. Sadness will erupt. But we don't see ourselves as being steady where we are. God is taking us through a dynamic process of growth. He's transforming our lives. Our lives are supposed to reflect more light and more light and more light until the day of perfection. The day of perfection has not yet come for any of us. Therefore, we ought to continue on in the journey. We don't give in. We don't give up. We don't stop along the way. We keep on moving. We run when we can. And when we're tired of running, what do we do? We walk. And when we are tired of walking, what do we do? Even if it means you crawling, you keep on crawling. But you don't stop where you are because God is leading you. The Bible says, don't give up. Looking unto Jesus, the author, the beginner, and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross. He bore the shame. We don't we don't give up. We look unto Jesus who did not give up. We don't give up. We keep on going. We keep on trekking. We keep on walking. And when the walking becomes too intense, we go ahead and crawl. It doesn't matter how quickly you're going. It doesn't matter the speed at which you're progressing. All that matters is that you're making a movement. All that matters is that you're following Jesus. Because one day, sooner or later, you will get to exactly where he intended 
for you to get. Shout a big amen. Therefore, stop comparing yourself. Stop comparing yourself to other people. The race of life is not for you to compete with one another. The race of life is between you and yourself. Uh, and the Lord Jesus in front of you, uh, he's comforting you. Uh, he's bringing grace to you. Uh, and he's telling you uh, where you're going. I've already been. Uh, and I assure you, uh, I'm able to lead you there. Uh, he that started this race with you. Uh, he that walked you in this path. Uh, he is able to bring you. Uh, he's able to motivate you. Uh, he's able to inspire you. Uh, he's able to make a way for you. Uh, that you may reach your destination. You don't give in. Uh, and you don't compare yourself to one another. Because when you do, you get frustrated. You get frustrated. And you count yourself as a failure. But this race is really between you and yourself. Your master who is in front of you. Who is not testing you. He has already seen the end. God has rigged the system on your behalf. He knows that you can make it. And that's why he created that path for you. He does not make a path for anyone that he knows they cannot make. He does not make a path for anybody that he knows they cannot overcome. And therefore, before you even started the race, he called you more than a conqueror. He called you an overcomer. My brothers and my sisters, be comfortable. Be comforted in this because the Lord himself has gone on ahead of you and he has made a way of escape. It doesn't matter what you're going through right now. He has seen the end from the very beginning. And the Lord who started you on this race, he can bring you to the end of it. Lift up your hands and shout hallelujah. And so I told you to acknowledge the four fires and I ask you to welcome the embarrassment, to welcome the shame. That shame can be a good thing. I told you that praise, praise and victories rarely build sustainable character. No, the most lessons, the lessons that will endure in your life are the ones you learn in the valley of life. The lessons that will endure, the building blocks of a sustainable future, of a sustainable character, are the ones you learn in the darkness, are the ones you learn in the pit. They are the characters you build up, the blocks you pick up when you're so down. Joseph was a man who had vision. He was a man who knew that there was a destiny for him, but he was a man who was proud. He was boastful. He was so full of himself. He was so arrogant. He was way too arrogant. And that was a mistake. That was a character defect. But that God did not give up on him because he was arrogant. Even the God who said that he will lift up the, the humble and bring down the proud. He knew that Joseph was a man who was full of pride. But he gave him time. He allowed life to visit him. And life dragged him into slavery, into servitude. And life took him into a place that he thought was going to be a good place. And he was happy. He was close to power now. He was a chief houseboy of, of the governor. But God said, this is not where I'm leading you to. Where you are right now may be better than where you were yesterday. But this is not yet the place I intend for you. And so what did he do? God is a God who stirs up things. Let me tell you something. Growth will never happen in your life until you become thoroughly uncomfortable about where you are right now. When you are comfortable, growth doesn't happen. He became comfortable. And what did God do? God introduced a woman who found him extraordinarily attractive and could not sleep and could not give up until she did something with him. And before he knew it, he was thrown into prison under the pretense of a false accusation. And Joseph was in prison. And in prison, in prison, in prison, character was built in prison that vision thing occasionally seeing things 
and trying to make sense of them in prison. He no longer had any distraction. People don't, when you read, when you read the story of Joseph, you think Joseph was such an innocent guy. He wasn't. Joseph knew that he was handsome. He was handsome and he knew it. And he did everything possible to show it. And so he was all about in the house, seducing the woman. And when the woman then requested to take possession of that which was seducing her, he refused. And she was so mad and angry and said, you know what, I'm going to deal with you. If you're going to be seducing me, you should be reachable. Shout amen. Shout amen. If you're going to be seductive, you should be reachable. Shout amen. And so Joseph was seductive. And when the woman came to take hold of that, which was seducing her, Joseph was playing games. And the woman said, it, I'm, I know what to do. You need to leave this house. And go to a place where you will not be able to seduce anybody. And in prison, Joseph lost his seduction. And he focused. And he developed the machinations of prophecy. He developed his machinations of prophecy. He became a student of the spirit. And right there, he thrived in his gift. He built the muscles of the talent in him. No more distractions. No more hyperactivity. No more inattention. He was focused. Because there was no woman in the house to impress. He was surrounded by a bunch of dudes. And there was no one. To impress somebody shout a man someone shout a man and his vision became elaborate his eyes became sharper the eyes of his understanding became enlightened and in the process of time a problem happened in the kingdom that needed a solution and at that time he was an expert in his talent have you become an expert in that which god has given you as his talent some of you have raw talent that have not been developed. You have raw talent and you're running away, boasting about the flashiness and the, and the fact that you just have the talent in your life. You don't know that the presence of talent does not equate greatness. You can have raw talent and still die miserable. You can have raw talent and never fully develop it. The graveyard is the richest place on earth. The graveyard is the richest place on earth. Because in the graves are talents of men and women that never saw the light of day. In the graves are people with political acumen that never ran for offices. In the grave are, are inspirational books that were never written. In the graves are teachers and scientists that never, ever invented anything. People die with their gifts more so than people develop their gifts. Why is that so? Because the, the mere mention of a gift makes people feel so important and so proud that they forget that the presence of a gift does not equate greatness. That a gift ought to be developed. And so Joseph needed a prison to develop his gift. And so we thank God for prisons. Say, say, I thank God for prisons. Say, I thank God for the prison experience. You know, some of us right now, you're going through the prison experience and you want it, you want it to end. You want it to end. You want your prison experience to end. And God is telling you there is still work for you to do. There is still something for you to develop. There is still a muscle for you to build. He said, no, just end the prison. Just end it. Just get me out of here. And then you get out of the prison unprepared, undeveloped, not ready, and then life hits you and you fall crashing. And God, in order to deliver the prison house, the walls of the prison are not just meant to keep you from living. They are meant to protect you. Sometimes. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking meta metaphorically. The prison wall 
that you call obscurity. The prison war that you call lack of relevance. I want to be a celebrity. I'm on TikTok. Why don't I get one million people? I want to be a celeb. And you, you post all your... The, the priest, what you call a prison war may be God's attempt to protect your life. Because if you're not ready for fame, fame will infame you. If you're not ready for fame, fame will infame you. Fame will destroy you. And so sometimes angels are running after you to try to drag you back into the prison that you broke out of. Because they're trying to protect you. Let's protect her. Let's protect him. He's not ready. And they're literally running after you to try to drag you back. And you're binding devils. And the devils you're buying are God trying to save you. Because if you escape your building house, if you escape your place of character, if you escape your place of endurance prematurely, depression will hit you. Life will hit you and depress you. And when life hits you and depress you, you have nothing to fall back on. And then you start thinking to yourself that life is not worth living. Say, so God forbid. Shout a big amen. The book of Psalm chapter 38 verse 4. This is what happens when, a, when someone comes out of their place of building, of character building, unprepared. When you come out of your season of preparation without having established roots. If you come out of your place of preparation without having established meaningful roots, Psalm 38 verse 4 happens to you. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My iniquities are gone over my head. As an heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. When life becomes too heavy for you, you start thinking about a way to end it. The weight of failure can feel overwhelming. The weight of failure can feel overwhelming. But what you don't want to do is to waste your time covering your weaknesses. I was speaking to my dear cousin yesterday and I was we're having some conversations and I told her there is a room for everyone to have a compliment. A compliment. There is always something in your life that someone else can compliment. Someone else can add to. What you don't want to do is to run away from people who are supposed to contribute to your life in a meaningful way. No matter how uncomfortable it feels, you open yourself to the opportunities for complimentation. Shout amen. Complimentation is important. Amen. An introvert you should not be so comfortable being introverted that they miss out on opportunities to have people pour into their lives. Because the extrovert who is out there also needs somebody perhaps who is introverted to supplement and to complement their lives. Such that they can have some time for tranquility. They can experience their inner selves. Be able to think within and, be, and feel at home within themselves and not be run up and down looking for external factors to satisfy them. So to the introvert, an extrovert can, make, can push that person to limits that they are not comfortable with. Introduce them. Make them more of, of leaders. People who say yes to opportunities. And to the extrovert, an introvert can help you reflect and be more introspective in your life. The book of Proverbs chapter 28, verse number 13. Proverbs 28, verse 13. Shout amen. It says, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have what? 
mercy. So I am not perfect. When you acknowledge that, this is my weakness. Don't just call it a sin. These are my areas of opportunities for growth. And don't just label them as such. Then do something about them. I am lacking this. I'm lacking that. I can do this and this. And my expectations are this and this. That by the grace of God, by this time, in the coming season, I would have accomplished this and this and this. And then you come back and you check. Have you accomplished those things? Smart goals. Specific. Measurable. Shout a big amen. It's got to also be realistic. Amen. Don't waste your energy. People waste their energy and spend their whole life trying to cover up areas of their lives. And God is watching. You know, I, 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 you've heard me say this before. God cannot bless a fake version of yourself. God will not bless a fake version of you. He can only bless the real version of you. And the blessing of God can come in the form of forgiveness, redemption, salvation, transformation, grace. God cannot give grace to the fake version of you. The Samaritan woman that Jesus met at the well came at the well as a married woman who had who was keeping to all the laws of the land she was just a traditional woman a normal woman who just came to the well to get water but jesus said, said to her you're not who you pretend to be in fact you're not just a married woman the man you're with right now is not your husband and you've been married not one not two not three times you've married five times And then it was <laughs> when she didn't acknowledge and said, you know what, this man, you're, you're, this man, you're something. This man, you're saying the truth. What you're saying makes sense. It's true. It's true. Once she then removed her pretense, removed her covering, her camouflage, Jesus could then bless her, show her mercy, show her forgiveness, show her meaning to life, show her validation. Show her encouragement. Give her strength. And then she ran back to her community and said, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Jesus did not need her help to reveal everything she ever did. But he needed to get to the core of the matter in order to bless her. God cannot bless the fake version of you. The made up version, he will bless. He wants the raw you with the smelly mouth with the crumbs all over you. That's who he wants to bless. If the prodigal son has spent time on his way, stealing from people, or borrowing from people, to buy good clothes, to buy gold and silver, to look like he had it all together, and then he, he continued on on his journey to meet his father. If he had done that, he would not have been welcomed the way he was. God will not bless the fake version of yourself. He's looking for your authentic self. No matter how messed up, how jacked up, how fallen you are, how depraved you are, how weak you are, no matter who you are, he's looking for the exact real version of yourself. That's who he can bless. Oh, lift up your hands and shout, I believe it. Thank you, Jesus. For all have sinned, Romans chapter 3 and 23. For all have seen, how many people? This is some. All, how many people? This is not the Old Testament. It says, for all have sinned. For all, and the scriptures cannot be broken. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I told you on Wednesday that grace is not for God. Look up. 
Grace is not for gods. Grace is not for angels. Grace is not for demons either. Grace is not for animals. Grace is not for the earth. Grace is for humans. Shout amen. Will you run to the book of Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9? And so when the depression hits you, when you can't sleep or you're sleeping too much, when you lose interest in the things you used to love, when you feel excessive guilt about yourself, about the things you've done in your life, when your energy level is no more, you have depleted energy. No matter how much you sleep, you wake up and you still feel exhausted. Not just exhaustion from your body, your soul is exhausted. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, when you cannot focus on the task at hand, when you have all the lack of concentration, you can't focus. No matter how much you try, you drink all the coffee in the world, and yet you cannot concentrate. When your appetite changes, you're either eating too much or too little. You can't even get out of bed to take care of yourself. When your body feels so heavy, heavy, heavy. Your soul is heavy. Your spirit is heavy. Your body is heavy as though your, your bone is many times over. Heavier than it should be. You have psychomotor retardation. Or perhaps you're fidgeted. You can't stand, stand still. You can't stay in one place. Everything is moving. Your thoughts, your thoughts are racing. Everything is, is in crisis mode. It's like, it's, like, it's like your body is moving at 200 miles an hour. And you can't catch yourself. When you're going through this test, you're probably dealing with major depression. Major depressive disorder. And with the depressed mood, you begin to feel that life is not worth living anymore. And you're just reminiscing, just fantasizing about, about death. About how it will be, how it will be good for you to sleep and not wake up. Or perhaps you're even thinking about things you can do to end your own life. If that is you, that is a serious problem. It should not be swept under the rug. You need to seek help immediately. And there is hope for you in scriptures. Let me tell you this. God does not permit anyone to end their lives. To end your life is to play God. And there can't be two gods in heaven. There can't be two gods on the throne. There's only God who shows mercy to the non-gods. So to end your life is to play God. And how can you play God and expect God to show you mercy? So you cannot end your life and think that it's okay. That somehow God will be okay with it. No. God means give out of life and take out of life. Don't end your life. Seek help. To take your life is to, is to do an irreversible thing for a temporary problem. No problem on earth has been given the authority to last forever. Nothing lasts forever. No problem on earth has the authority to last forever. No problem on earth has the ability to last forever. So no matter what you're dealing with right now, it cannot last forever. Therefore, don't take an irreversible action for a 
temporary problem. You will outlive every problem that comes your way in the name of Jesus. You will see the end of it. As you see the beginning of your problems, so shall you see the end of it in the name of Jesus Christ. Every problem that you see coming, by the grace of God, you will see the end of it. And you will include it in your story of victory for generations to come to read about and to learn from you and to learn hope and to learn faith and to understand that no matter how bad it feels right now tomorrow will come again and joy shall yet come the bible says and the word of god cannot be broken he said though sadness and sorrow may endure for the night though sadness and depression may linger through the night. He says, joy. Joy comes in the morning. I prophesy to you somebody, your joy is coming. Your joy is coming. This problem shall not be the end of you. For the Lord God of heaven, who has seen your end from your beginning, he shall yet bring you out of your calamity. He shall drag you by the hand. He shall lead you through the troubled water. Us, uh, the God of heaven, uh, he will bring you uh, through this peril of your life. Uh, lift up your hands and say, yeah. It doesn't matter how deep it is. It doesn't matter how deep it is. If God will not dry the Red Sea in front of you, if he will not do that which he did for the people of Israel, if God will not use you to dry up the Red Sea like he did in the time of Moses, I guarantee you there are many ways for God to deal with the problem. God will. He can. He can allow you to walk right on top of the water. And if that is not even possible, the Lord himself is the ark of salvation. He will come you as a canoe. He will carry you as a boat. He will ride. He will ride the storm. You will ride the wave. The Lord himself will be your canoe. He will be your sheep. He will ride in him and you will cross over onto the other side. Say, I shall not die, but I shall live to declare the works of the Lord in the land of the living. Say, my problem shall not see the end of me, but I shall see the end of my problem. If you believe and lift up your hands and shout hallelujah. We don't let our problems bury us. We live to tell our stories. To generations yet unborn. That our eyes will see. That our ears will hear. That I have been, oh, I'll be young and now I'm old. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their children beg bread. And the word of God cannot be broken. God is too faithful to fail. God is too faithful to fail. He sees your tears. He knows your sleeplessness. He knows your challenges. He has seen it, but he believes. Somehow he believes in you that you will pull through. Somehow he believes in you that you will overcome. If God believes in you, who are you? not to believe in yourself. If the maker of the universe believes in you, you better believe it that God has made a way of escape. He has seen the end of this trouble. You can't end your life now. You can't end your story like this. That is hope for you. That is tomorrow for you. If you believe it, lift up your head and say, yeah! The devil is counting on you to become stupid, to see the truth, and to bow in and to yield to the suicidality. He's counting on you, just like he counted on Judas Iscariot to end your life. But your life was not given to you by you. Therefore, you can't take it. You don't own your life. He, God owns your life. The maker of the universe who made you owns your life. You don't take your life. You keep on fighting. You keep on fighting. And when you're tired of fighting, you cry out for help. You look for help amongst the community of your friends, community of your faith, medical community. In prayer, you look for help. But you don't die. 
in silence. Lift up your hands, everybody. You shout, Lord, I believe you. Why don't you rise up on your feet? Let us pray. Thank you, Jesus. O sagangra li crofra li scandra tovra la traski vrotis aria da vrandis coria praliaza. God does not reject us even when we fail. And we should not reject ourselves. If God does not reject us even when we fail, then we have no business rejecting ourselves. You will not let your problems see the end of your life. You will not let your problem see the end of your life. You will see the end of every problem and you will write about them. And God will use your story to motivate someone else. God will use your experience to teach someone else. God will use your experience to inspire a community that is yet a person for you to impact in your life. Therefore, you shall not die, but you will live to declare the, what the Lord has done. The book of Psalm chapter 118 verse 17. You shall not die, but live to tell the story of your victory. Shout a big amen. Shout a big amen. Shout a big amen. I shall not die, but leave. I'll survive. I'll make it to tell the works of the Lord's salvation, to tell of the works of God's grace. How God can make a nobody into somebody. How God can make a lowly person into someone highly exalted. I'll live to tell of my story. I'll live to tell of my story. Of how God can take a mess and turn it into a message. How God can take your test, the testing of your faith, and make it into a testimony. How God can take your trials and turn them into triumph. I'll live to tell the story of the works of the Lord God Almighty. Father, I will give you praise for such a message as this. In this time of discovering the utility and the providence of the Spirit of God in this series on the Holy Ghost. You have allowed us to see and to talk and to discuss realities of the modern church, realities of the world, of the earth that we live in, realities of our brothers and sisters, mental health issues. And you're allowing us to see that even Scripture acknowledges the plentifulness of problems in life. He said trials will come, tribulations will come. Say, yeah, don't give up, don't give in. Be confident that I have overcome the world. And you gave us a spirit, not the spirit of despair, but the spirit of comfort. We call him the Holy Spirit. You call him the spirit, the comforter. Why would you call him the comforter? Why would you call him the counselor? Why would you call him the helper? You call him the advocate. Lord, it's because you know that in this world, we're going to need somebody. We're going to need a body, an ally, a partner to walk with us, to, to pat us on the back sometimes, to give us thumbs up sometimes, to bow his head along with us and to say a prayer on our behalf sometimes. And that's exactly what the spirit of grace has done. For 2,024 years, he has not given up on humanity. He has seen all kinds of atrocities, all kinds of civilizations. He's seen all kinds of things, but he has not bolted on us. He has seen legislations, the ones that God doesn't really like and the ones that he likes. He has seen all kinds of things, but yet the Holy Spirit has not given up on humanity. He hasn't caught up. He hasn't gone on a strike. He hasn't become angry. He hasn't destroyed the world. He hasn't judged the world. He hasn't condemned the world. Then who are we to condemn the world? Who are we to condemn ourselves? If the person who is literally called Holy Spirit is in the world full of dirty people. 
yet he has not condemned us. He has not condemned the church. Who are we to be bickering and condemning denominations and sects and practices and judging pastors and ministers, destroying one another, making the names, the names for ourselves, being in the business of tearing down other people? And yet the Holy Spirit himself is with us, not condemning a single person. Show us, O oh God, a better way. Give us, I pray, Father, the spirit of repentance. We bow before you, we ask that you give us a heart, a heart of love, a heart of humility, to see things like you see things. Oh God, I pray that you will help us as your church forgive us our trespasses and help us to forgive everyone else who has trespassed against us may we walk intimately with the Holy Spirit may we find comfort in the Holy Spirit not just to talk in rubbish languages in non- intelligent words not just to brag about spiritual concepts that we can't even fully explain but to really look into the lives of people around us and our own lives to embrace the problems of humanity that depression is real mental health crises are real that people are struggling amongst us and oh God, we pray that our churches will wake up to the problems of members of our own families. And our God, we pray that even this realization, this awakening, will bring comfort to those who are suffering. Oh God, we pray that the church will not pretend to be a perfect place but to admit to being the clinic of sinners and for sinners and for sick people where Jesus is the chief physician. And God will pray that once we realize our true identity in the global scheme of things, in the will of God, that we will become more welcoming to others. And that people will find hope, faith, and love in our communities. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. We we'll give you praise, O oh God. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we honor you for what you've done and what you continue to do. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Shout a big amen. Lift up your hands and shout amen. Shout a bigger amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We give you praise. How many of you are blessed already? Now, we have opportunities to give. Now, remember, here in Omnipresent Church, we don't believe that tithing is a requirement for you to get them blessed. We don't believe that. We believe that that giving is the attitude of blessed people. Again, I will say that again, that we don't believe that tithing is a requirement for God's blessing. 99.9% mm -mm. .9 of churches will tell you that when you bring your tithe, then God will bless you. It's wrong. It's not true. Not in the New Testament. Absolutely not. Giving is the attitude of blessed people. We give because we love. And we give because we recognize that God has blessed us already. We don't give to get blessed. We give because we are blessed. Shout amen. Shout amen.
all the time. And so we give because, you know, you're so full of joy. And you love your God and you love your people of faith. And you just want to, you just want to bless the things of God. You want the work of God to continue. You want your pastors and those who serve in ministry to be able to continue to have sustenance. And so you give. You say, Lord, I thank you for making me a part of your family. And I thank you for providing for me to be in a position to give. Therefore, I give with joy. That's what it means by saying God loves a cheerful giver. He didn't tell you to force yourself to be cheerful so you can give. Uh -uh. He didn't say force yourself to give as you're giving on the condition of law. Uh -uh. Nobody gives cheerfully when they are made or forced or commanded or manipulated to thinking that if they don't give, they are going to be cursed. It doesn't give you joy to give. When you tell, someone tells you if you don't give, you're cursed. You're giving out of fear. That's not cheerfulness. God loves a cheerful giver because cheerful people are cheerful when they recognize that they are not giving to get blessed, but they are giving because they are blessed. And so they are giving out of gratitude. They are giving out of love. They are giving out of hope. They are giving out of peace. And so they are dancing. They are cheerful. And when God says that, he loves it. Because then you're acting like God. For the Bible says, for God so loved that he gave. So when you love, you give. It's not when you fear that you give. You don't have that casco ralita. When someone forces you to give out of fear, that's not love. That's not cheerfulness. When you love, you give. And when you give out of love, you're cheerful. And when God gives you, when God sees you giving out of cheerfulness, he loves it. Shout to me, gay man. Shout to me. This is the truth. It doesn't matter what anyone else tells you. This is the truth. Now God, give, God loves a cheerful giver. And cheerful giving can only come from a place of love. For God so loved the world that he gave. So we give to simulate our attitude and our nature as children of God. For as he is in heaven, so are we on earth. Shout a big amen. So if you are cheerful and you are grateful and you are in love and you are happy to, please, you have opportunities to give to our ministry. Also remember that every gift you give to us by the grace of God, they are tax deductible because our organization is a 501c3 organization. May the Lord keep you and bless you. May God himself smile over you. May he grant you peace in the innermost being of yourself. May God give you a sense of hope and a sense of comfort in your spirit and in your mind. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I also now ask you to join us as to participate in the communion of the breaking of bread. Communion of breaking of bread. Communion of breaking of bread. You are Lord. I'm a strength, my rock. You alone does my spirit. You alone, I'm a strength. Isaiah in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord. This represents the sacrifice that Jesus made on Calvary's tree. He started this. He started it. And he, he instructed us 
to remember him this way. And so today we remember you, Father of Jesus Christ, Father of the living church, the beginner of the church, the sustainer of the church, the finisher of the church. We remember that you were broken, you were spat on, you were beat up, and you took it all to accomplish eternal salvation for all men. We celebrate you today. And as we eat, we command everything within us to yield to the mission of salvation. We bring and subjugate our physical bodies to the life stream of health that flows from the body of Christ. We command impurities and ailments and sicknesses to be removed from us. And we welcome the peace of Christ not only into our spirit but our minds and our bodies. And we celebrate you God for who you are. You may eat with us. In the same way, he took the cup and after he had blessed it, he said, drink. It's a new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Remember you, Jesus. By your stripes, we are healed. That's why we call this service the life stream of health. By your stripes, we are healed. Because from you flows the issues of life, the river of life, the life giving stream of health. We receive it now into our bodies. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen. The life given stream of health. I pray in the name of Jesus, I hope to be given to you today. That the grace of Christ fills you. And that this grace establishes strength within you. Amen. I pray that you pick up the stamina of life. The conviction for living. That you will become convinced that your problems will not see the end of you. God will enable you to have the desire to live again. That God will give you interest again in winning. And that you will win over every storm of your life. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship with the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. Lift up your hands and shout a big hallelujah. Now let us dance and be merry. Now remember, on Wednesday, we shall be back for the Family Bible and prayer time. The family Bible and prayer time. Also known as the Apostolic Power Night. May the Lord bless you. 
May the Lord keep you. Why don't you rise up if you can and just dance with us. For the Lord is good and his mercies endureth forever. Amen.